Today's speaker is Ian Anderson, um, and he will give a lecture series, so actually three lectures on symmetries, conservation laws, and variational principles. So please. Okay, well, thank you very much, Katya, for the opportunity to, to speak at the seminar. Uh, I guess let me begin, let's see how my pen is here, uh, with a happy new year to everyone and with uh, wishes and hopes for a, for a less stressful year. We've been through a lot uh, the last couple of years. So I had to think a little bit about what to speak about uh, in, in, in these lectures. Uh, recently, I've been doing some pretty interesting work. I think it's interesting work on two, three, five distributions and uh, geometry of differential equations. I think I'm gonna hold, not talk on that here, uh, but rather save that uh, for the, the meeting this summer in, in Warsaw. So that, uh, I think I'll talk on that. So also uh, last year I gave a talk on the introduction to the variational bi-complex and it, there was promises of a follow-up talk which, which never really materialized. So maybe I thought I would talk about symmetries, conservation laws and variational principles and, and work our way back into some of the ideas we talked about uh, last year on the variational bicomplex. Uh, symmetries, conservation laws, and variational principles. Well, there must be a thousand papers <laughs> conservatively dealing with these topics. So uh, there's an enormous amount of literature on this. And so uh, my apologies for the approach I'm gonna take, which is to simply uh, uh, give you a little tour or, or walk, walk along a path that I've taken in this area over the last uh, many years. So uh, this is, is simple. So the, the topics and the way I'm presenting it is just simply a reflection of my own, own experiences in this, in this subject. So the talk is, uh, the talks are divided into three parts. First part is symmetries. The next part will be conservation laws. The third part will be Noether's theorems and their, and their variation variants. And then uh, we might talk a little bit about invariant variational principles and other things as, as if time <clears throat> allows. Uh, this is not the first time I've given a, a series of lectures. And as Katja was, was reminding me, it typically starts off uh, fairly gentle, but over the course of three hours, it ramps up and gets kind of complicated and specialized as time goes on. I'm gonna do my best to try and avoid that and keep things at an elementary level uh, for the whole, whole set of lectures. And so uh, again, let me make an apology to, to those of you who are experts in the field. So the first subject that we wanna talk about is, is symmetries. And I wanna talk about the sort of classical Lee external approach, then the internal approach or the differential systems approach, and then talk a little bit about higher order symmetries. So the starting point uh, is, for me at least, will be a, a, a fiber bundle, E, let's see, right, where are we? Right, oops, right, right here, E over, M. And I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> this is not the most general setting uh, you can take. Also, so I'm going to look at kind of to keep things simple and to avoid technicalities, I'm going to keep the situation or the foundational starting point as simple as possible. And from that, I think most people know that on top of E, you can build what's, what's called the jet bundle of E. And uh, in local coordinates, that's the coordinates on the base the coordinates on the fiber, coordinates which represent the derivatives of u with respect to x, coordinates which represent the second derivatives of u with respect to the x's and so on. And this jet space is not just some arbitrary manifold. It comes equipped with a contact distribution or a contact Fafian system. A Fafian system is a, is a collection of one forms and here I've written down what the first one form is. It's du alpha minus the derivatives times dx. Then the first derivative is minus, my writing is not too good there, minus the second derivative of x and, and so on. Uh, and this contact distribution is characterized, here's my E over M. This contact distribution is characterized by 
the fact that if I take a section of a local section yeah. of my fiber bundle, I lift that section up into the jet space, and that lift is often called PR of S, or prolongation of S, then the prolongation of my section of S kills the contact form. So if I pull back the contact forms by that <clears throat> prolonged section, I get, I get zero. And that's one way of characterizing the contact distribution or the, this contact Fafian system. <clears throat> Let me erase this for a second here. So now let's consider a, a group action on, on our space E. And I've said I wanted to look at a, a projectable action. So again, here's E. And here's M down here. And a projectable group action is a transformation group on the space E, which covers the transformations on, on M. And then a very basic fact then is that uh, any transformation group, projectable transformation group on E lists to a transformation group on jet space. So there's an induced set of transformations up on jet space. And that's called the, the prolonged group action. And the criteria for calculating this prolongation is that it's going to present, it's a unique lift which uh, preserves the contact ideal. And the idea for this, the construction of this is, is, I think, well known. Let me see if I can say how it goes. What we do is we start with a point down here, x, and some section of E. And we use an inverse transformation, G inverse, to bring that back to another point. We then apply our section to that point. So here's S and here's S. And then push forward by the group action again. And that gives us, so I started with a section here. And this gives me a new section, which I should call G times S. It's the action of my transformation group on the original section. And then uh, the prolongation action is then defined by taking the prolongation uh, of this, lifting this up to jet space. Okay. The formulas for this prolongation action, even in very simple cases, are incredibly complicated. It's like chain rule hell. Uh, I think Lee's great discovery, one of his many great discoveries was that if we worked infinitesimally with vector fields, then this prolongation action is quite easy to write down. And so if we start with a vector field X, then the infinitesimal version of the statement above is that X lists uniquely to a vector field on jet space with the property that all the contact forms are Lee differentiated into contact forms. The formula, for uh, prolongation for the prolonged vector field is called the, the Lee prolongation formula. And uh, as I was going over my slides last night, I just wanted to re remind myself and, and you that uh, as soon as people started doing computer algebra systems, like the, the early ones, reduce and ma maxima, the very first applications of computer algebra systems were one, to compute the curvature tensor of a metric. And two, the other important applications was the impl implementation of the Lee uh, prolongation formula. This allowed you to study the Einstein equations with some degree of generality. And having a computer program that would compute these prolongations was the first step that you needed in order to begin to calculate symmetries uh, of differential equations. <clears throat> Uh, we, there are various generalizations of this formula. Here I kept the vector field projectable, so it projects to this. You can go to what's called a point vector field in which the coefficients now depend upon X and U. And this is a transformation on E. And all you can say is locally, it will preserve sections. And that's enough for you to extend 
uh, this uh, action locally and thereby extend the, the uh, bleed prolongation formula. The formula really doesn't change when you make this change, at, when you make this slight generalization. Uh, hard to avoid talking about Beckland's theorem. <clears throat> Beckland's theorem is kind of a, a general question that one, one can ask in, in dealing with symmetry groups of differential equations. But in the so-called free case where we have no differential equation, we can ask the following question. Take a vector field Z on our manifold. So that's a completely arbitrary vector field. It's not necessarily coming from the prolongation of a vector field on the base, but just require that it preserves the, the contact ideal. Then you can ask what such vector fields look like. And you get a bifurcation in the result. If M is greater than one, that's the fiber dimension of our space, then Z is a prolongation of a vector field on E. If M is equal, if fiber dimension is one, then Z is a prolongation of a vector field on, on the one jet. And there's various ways of proving this, but I think the best way to think about this is the following. If we have our contact ideal, then we can calculate, depends whether you want to do this in terms of forms or, or distributions, you can calculate the derived, um, uh, you can uh, calculate the derived flag of this uh, in, in terms of form, that's a decreasing collection of differential forms. And each of these derived flags have what they call Cauchy characteristics. So, so this has some Cauchy characteristics, this has some Cauchy characteristics. And then the argument is, that if Z preserves I, then it has to preserve the derived flag, the second derived flag, and all these Cauchy characteristics. And then from that, you can infer that this vector field is necessarily a prolongation of a vector field on the base. Uh, saying that it preserves these Cauchy characteristics says that this action, that this vector field restricts to the least of, the, uh, of, of these Cauchy characteristics. These are integral distributions. And that, that's how you can see how this is going conceptually. And so uh, when we go to generalize the Beckland theorem, this is the kind of thing we want, we want, we want to look at. We want to look at uh, the distribution that we have, and we want to look at it, its derived flags. <clears throat> uh, a very important formula for us is, is, is uh, a certain decomposition formula for the prolongation of a vector field. And it splits into two pieces called the total vector field and the prolongation of the evolutionary vector field. And algebraically, this formula is, is pretty interesting, is pretty simple. Here's the, my vector field on E that I'm starting with. And then the total component of this is just the, um, <clears throat> the coefficients of the independent variables, AI, times the total derivative operator. So on jet spaces, we always have this formal process of differentiation called total derivative. It's the derivative of X plus the derivative of U times the derivative of X plus the derivative of the first derivatives times the second derivatives and so on. So the variational calculus, this is the, the most important operator you have. You can also uh, get your hands on these total derivative operators from the contact ideal by taking their annihilator. So the annihilator of the contact forms are in part, not in completely, but are in part uh, spanned by these total vector fields. And the evolutionary component of, of our um, prolongation is given by this formula right here. I take my uh, vertical components and I said, whoops, this should have been an, I should subtract off the um, derivatives of this. So let me rewrite that again. It's B alpha minus U alpha I A alpha. And uh, when AI. we get, yeah, AI. oh, AI, yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, when we get to our discussion of Noether's theorem, this prolongation formula will play a key, this decomposition formula will play a key role. Let's, let me just look at a simple example of this because there's a couple of cautionary notes that we should, we should make. So I, I took for an example, uh, 
just uh, the total space is R2 with coordinates X and Y, and the base space is just the real line X. And I took from my vector field just X partial X. So X is X partial X. The flow of X maps X to U. So this is a scaling symmetry, so we can easily calculate the flow of this, and we'll find the flow of this is e to the x, and then u stays the same. So that scaling vector field corresponds to <clears throat> it's just scaling the independent variable x. And then easy chain rule exercise is to show that the flow of the prolongation, that the flow acts on derivatives by e to the t, t, u, and let's see, if I uh, increase the size of the derivative of the x, then that sort of decreases the size of the derivative by the same amount. And then the second derivative will scale twice as slowly and so on. So there's our, there's our uh, prolonged action. I said in general, the formula is pretty complicated, but in this case, it's pretty easy. Uh, from that, I can diff back differentiate and see that the prolongation is given by this vector field here. Scale x, scale the derivative in the opposite direction, scale the second derivative twice as much. So there's the prolongation. Calculate it just sort of on the back of the envelope without using the prolongation formula because I could easily write down what the action, what the action of the vector field x is and how that action acts on derivatives. <clears throat> the total part then is just x dx. Now I've written, written it out in detail here. And the evolutionary part is just, uh, is just going to be b, which is 0, minus u x times a. So that's minus x times ux, which is what I wrote down over here. And one of the nice things about this uh, prolongation formula is that if we have a vector field, um, y equals c alpha partial u alpha, then the prolongation is just given by differentiating all the coefficients. So somehow prolongation always means differentiate in this area. And so we just differentiate all the coefficients with respect to all, all the total in all directions. And that gives us our prolongation formula for an evolutionary vector field. And here it is right here. And if I start uh, adding these two pieces together, this piece, well, uh, this piece, I hit the wrong, I've done something here. What have I done? Uh, this, this term is my original term. Uh, <clears throat> the, this term here uh, cancels with, with this term here. So there's no u component. If I expand out this derivative and add it to this, I get this and so on. So there's the, the prolongation formula right there. But if this, these vector fields, x tote and x ev, are a little bit weird because it's hard to write down the flow of x tot. So what would the flow of x tot look like? Well, the equations for the flow are x dot equals some, pick a parameter, a curve parameter, call it differentiation with respect to that parameter. So the curve the flow would be this, uh, u dot equals the coefficient of this, which would be x ux and u dot x equals x ux and u dot x double dot equals u x x x. Okay, no problem integrating this equation. It's what we just, just did right up here. But now this one, how are we going to integrate this one? Well, in order to integrate this one, we need to know how ux is changing. Well, here's how ux is changing, but to integrate this one, we need to know how uxx is changing. And to integrate this one, we need to know this. So this equation here, this vector field, should be thought of sort of as a formal vector field. It eats functions, 
perfectly okay. Uh, but it doesn't really have a flow at, attached to it. So we have a, a peculiar situation here, which we should be very, kind of careful about. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, in that, we, this thing here is a perfectly good vector field on a finite dimensional manifold, but somehow we've broken it apart into two kind of suspicious looking objects, each of which are formal vector fields, but really don't. This has a flow, but neither of these pieces have a well-defined flow. So I just wanted to make that point. So sometimes overlooked in, in this discussion. Okay, so I think everybody knows where this is going. So now let's consider a, a system of, of differential equations. We're not going to ask too much about the, whether this is an undetermined system, an overdetermined system, or a determined system, elliptic or hyperbolic. None of that really matters too much. And the definition then of an external symmetry is a vector field on E such that the Lie derivative of the prolongation of x applied to the differential equation is zero mod the differential equation. Okay. This is a large overdetermined system of linear PDEs for the coefficients of x. And uh, we'll, we'll get well, la later on, we'll make a few remarks about that. Of course, this better be true, and it is true. If x and y are symmetries, then the bracket of two vector fields is also a symmetry, an easy consequence of some lead derivative formulas. <clears throat> the picture we can draw for this is something like this. Here's jet space. This equation delta equals zero generates a some submanifold of this. And our vector field is a vector field on all of jet space with the property that at points of this equation submanifold, the vector field is tangent. And so we can say then that along the flows of this vector field, um, two things are happening. The contact ideal is preserved in the entire space and uh, if I start at a point on the equation manifold, I'll flow to another point on the equation manifold. Okay. So the internal approach uh, to symmetries is the following. Let me erase this stuff here real quick. The internal approach is the, is the following. We just have some manifold N. And on N, we have a Fafian system. And then an infinitesimal se uh, se se symmetry of this Fafian system is just a vector field on N, which preserves the contact ideal. So this definition is very, very clean. And it avoids all this uh, discussion of prolongation and, and so on although it's sort of secretly buried and encoded in there. Every system of, of, of partial differential equations can be encoded as, as a Fafian system. And then it follows then that every external symmetry uh, uh, can be prolonged and restricted to an internal symmetry. Okay. <clears throat> Backlund's type arguments can provide a converse to this, to this fact. And so a simple example is the following. Consider a second order partial differential equation in the plane. So in this case here, uh, we, we're, on, we're looking at J2, oops, of R2, that's the number of independent variables and one independent variable, R, Differential system is encoded as a single function. So we have this seven manifold. Okay. And on J2, we have our, 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 stand, our contact system. And so an external vector field will be a vector field um, Z, 
which preserves this contact system and is tangent to this equation manifold. An internal symmetry says go off and just look at this seven manifold. On the seven manifold, this contact system restricts to this seven manifold. And if we, uh, we can de denote that by a collection of one forms like this. We have three one forms on a seven manifold. I think, I'll, let me draw the corresponding distribution. So I have a distribution like this and an internal symmetry is a, a vector field whose flows map the, uh, preserve this distribution. So if I start here, flow, this distribution, I get to another, I get to the same distribution at another point and, and so on, okay? And this theorem asserts the following. If you start with a internal symmetry, so you're in this picture here, then there's actually a vector field on the whole space on all of J2, whose restriction at the one jet level is the vector field you started with. Okay, so this is a case where there's no distinction, real distinction between internal and external symmetries. Okay. And there's a famous theorem, a counter, well, I don't know if it's famous, there's a counter example to, to this uh, equivalence between internal and external symmetries. And it, this, is, is it, this is due to Carton. And he looks at the following funny system of equations. It's a system of of two differential equations, uh, uxx equals zero and uxyy equals zero. So we're kind of on the, the three jet of R2 to R. And uh, we, this is a 10 manifold. And if we subtract off our two equations, we're on an eight manifold, okay? And so on that eight manifold, I can write down following Fothian system. This is the restriction of the contact system to this system of uh, differential equations. And I have one, two, three, four, five. So this is a rank five Fothian system on an eight manifold. And uh, you can just calculate very easily that this is a symmetry. The Lie derivative of omega one is omega two. And right away we see that this vector field X is the symmetry of these forms because it's Lie differentiating one into the other, but it's not preserving this form. And this is the contact form on the free jet space. And so this vector field is an internal symmetry, but it's not an external symmetry. Okay, it's not the restriction of an external symmetry. Could you have seen this coming? Yes, you could have seen this coming because if you take the derived flags of, of this Fothian system, at the terminal de derived flag is omega one, omega two. And so any symmetry um, uh, will Li differentiate omega one and omega two into omega one and omega two, but not necessarily omega one into omega two. If we go back to this other theorem that we talked about right here, then if we write down the contact system for this, the contact system for this, oh, here they are right here. It's these three forms right here. The derived flag of this is just the contact form theta itself. And so if I have a symmetry of the whole thing, it's got to be preserve the derived. So it's got to preserve this. And that's the essence of why this theorem, theorem is true. So, uh, I don't think there's a lot of mystery to this uh, story of when internal and external systems, uh, uh, external and internal symmetries agree or disagree. You can get a pretty good idea of what's going on by calculating some very simple invariants for, the, for your uh, differential equations, namely the so-called derived flags and their Cauchy characteristics. Okay. Okay, the next topic that it, um, for discussion is absolutely essential uh, is to talk about generalized symmetries. So 
we already saw that if we start putting derivatives in these lower or, or coefficients, we get objects which are uh, which look like vector fields, but they don't have any flows attached to them in the classical sense. And this is certainly the case of these generalized vector fields. So here I'm going to take a vector field, which is taking values in E, but the coefficients are allowed to depend upon uh, X, U, and their derivatives to any order. Again, because the Lie prolongation formula is purely algebraic, you can apply uh, the prolonga least prolongation formula to this kind of object right here without any problem. And then you can say that X is a generalized symmetry of our system of differential equations. If again, the Lie derivative of the vector fields applied to the equation is zero, but now it's, this is, has to hold not by virtue of the equation, but by virtue of the equation and it, its derivatives to whatever order you need, to whatever order is appearing in the coefficients of, of these equations right here. Now you do get one, one uh, simplifi slight simplification when you calculate general symmetries. And that comes from using our, our prolongation form, our decomposition formula. So the prolongation of the vector field applied to our system of differential equations delta, I can split into two pieces. The prolongation, the, the, the total vector field of X applied to delta and the prolongation of the evolutionary part. But let's write out what that X tote piece is. That X tote of delta is just AI DI of delta. Aha, but we're computing mod, here we're going to compute mod delta and di of delta. So modulo the relations we're imposing, this vector field part, the total part drops out. And so this part goes away by virtue of our uh, side conditions here. And the prolongation just becomes the prolongation of the evolutionary part. So you can say now that to calculate generalized symmetries, it suffices to look at vector fields, which are only uh, point in the fiber directions and have arbitrary coefficients depending upon the base. That leads us to another important simplification. And that's the following. Let me just stop for a minute. And that's the uh, so-called linearization of a differential operator or a different system of differential equations. And so here I have, I've written down just a second order differential equation. And uh, let me replace U, let me do a, a little perturbation in U by letting U be replaced by U plus TV and then differentiate with respect to T. And I get this equation right, right here. And I'm going to define, now I'm going to replace these, I'm going to, I think of this as a differential operator in V, so it's a linear differential operator in V, and I'll, I'll denote this linear differential operator by script L of, of delta, script L not for Lie derivative here, but for, for differentiation. And then the generalized symmetry equation is the Lie derivative, I've written it down here, Lie derivative, so you apply the linearized operator to the components of the evolutionary, of an evolutionary vector. And you wanna solve that mod delta and its derivatives, and that will calculate for you the, the symmetries of the equations. Okay. So if you're trying to, we're gonna need this. Let's see, what, what, what's the right, okay. Okay, so generalized symmetries can be calculated for all kinds of, of differential equations. Uh, the soliton equations are where it really became important. These uh, soliton equations have generalized symmetries, or maybe in the literature they're called higher order equations. And one of the important things here is you have something that's called a recursion operator, script R. And if you apply the uh, recursion operator to the component C of a generalized symmetry, that gives you a another generalized symmetry C prime. And with a little bit of care, 
you can use this then to show that these soliton equations have an infinite number of, of higher order symmetries. For Laplace's equation, it's a class of equation, and many people have, have calculated the higher order symmetries of, of this equation. And then some of the applications uh, of that are in quite an important paper by, 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 Mike, by our friend Mike Eastwood. That, that paper appeared in the, the Annals of Math. For scalar partial differential equations, I, I think I want to think about something like uh, Louisville's equation. Uh, equations which are so-called Darboux integrable. Uh, and the, the simplest example of this is um, uh, the Louisville equation. There are higher order generalized symmetries. Uh, this was worked out uh, sort of in a paper by, with Nick, by Nick Cameron and myself, and also in a, a paper by Sokolov and Zeber. And they give a, a closed form formula for gener in terms of the intermediate integrals uh, for calculating higher order uh, generalized symmetries of Darboux integral equations. It's kind of interesting to note that this sort of formula that they write down doesn't generate all the symmetries, it generates most of them. And I've always wondered how, to, how, how, how one could un understand sort of this, this uh, discrepancy between the general formula for generating these higher order symmetries and the complete set of generalized symmetries. In a, a paper that is horrendous in terms of its sheer number of indices, is a paper I wrote with Charles Torrey in which we calculated the higher order symmetries of the Einstein equations. And probably to no one's surprise, there weren't any. All the, all the um, higher order symmetries, the Einstein equations are just formal generalizations of, of, the kill, of, of killing vectors. So we found that, uh, so that we, the, the, the a characteristic would look like a characteristic symmetry for the Einstein equations would look like this. Let me re rewrite that over here. So for the Einstein equations, our characteristics would look like this. And these depend upon the metric, the derivatives of the metric, the second derivatives of the metric and arbitrary order. And then basically what we have to do is take the Einstein equations, G, I, J, calculate their linearization and then apply the linearization of the Einstein equations to these CIJs and sol solve these equations. And you have to do this mod the Einstein equations, mod GIJ equals zero, mod the covariant derivatives of this and so on. And uh, this seemed hopeless to me, but uh, my good friend, Charlie Torrey said, no, we, we should be able to do this because Penrose has, has shown us how to use two component spinners to give a very elegant parameterization of the equation manifold. So using two component spinners is a way of getting yourself onto this equation manifold and then uh, doing these calculations, but it was pretty tough. Oh, and what was the answer? The answer was that Cij was just some vector field depending upon the metric and as many derivatives as you want, and then take a formal covariant derivative and, and, and symmetrized and symmetrized. Uh, but my our friend Yuha Pumpelto took this spinner formalism and used, used it to calculate the higher order symmetries of Maxwell's equations. And I know many people here kind of like and uh, like uh, two, three, five distributions, the fam most famous of which is, is this Carton, Hilbert Carton equation. And uh, I, ca I calculated the generalized symmetries of this and ended up with G2. And that sort of got me interested in symmetry groups and internal versus external symmetries and, and so on. Uh, there was a fellow, Paul Kirsten, and he said, well, what are the generalized symmetries of the Hilbert Carton equation? And he got this one right here. So he, he gave a whole list of so-called higher order symmetries for the Hilbert Carton equation. And I was just thinking about this and what, what I might be, it's easy to check this. Let's see how, what, would, what does it mean to check it? So we would have a vector field, which would look like something like A partial U 
plus b uh, partial v. And the linearized equation for this would be dx of b equals, take the derivative of this, equals uxx d uxx of, of a. So there's the linearized equation applied to the characteristics. That's the equation you have to solve in order to find generalized symmetries of the, of the hilbert cartan equation. And off you go. Pretty fun, ex easy exercise just to plug these values in. This would be, this would be uh, our A, and this would be our, our B. And, uh, and get that to work. And I was just thinking about, well, can you ascribe any meaning to this? And yes, sometimes for these generalized symmetries, you can not look at the flow as an ODE, but you can look at the flow as, as a evolution, a, par a partial differential evolution equation. So in that case, this would be this. And so somehow you want to integrate this PDE. Well, you can, you can write down solutions for that, plug the solution into here and integrate up and then integrate to get V. So you can associate to any one of these evolution equations, uh, an, an evolution equation, I guess, to any of these evolutionary vector fields, you can associate an evolutionary PDE, which is a sort of infinite dimensional version of the flow. Now I was just thinking last night, well, wouldn't it be kind of interesting uh, we know this hilbert cartan equation has something to do with balls rolling, thanks to Igor, thank, but one ball rolling on another ball can be for, formulated as a 2, 3, 5 distribution. Maybe we should calculate this flow and see what that does to this uh, spinning ball. So we could have a, a geometric picture of the flow of this, this differential equation here. Uh, I don't know that's it might be kind of an interesting visual exercise. Okay, so uh, no discussion of symmetries would be complete without a, a quick overview of, of how you can calculate them in Maple or some other computer language. In Maple, in the PDE e tools package, there's a command called um, infinitesimals. And this will calculate, as best I can tell, the point symmetries of a DE. And the answer comes out of, of a PDE. The answer comes out in some kind of strange uh, formula, uh, but it's easy to, I wrote a command called convert, which will take the output of this infinitesimal command. It's called convert DG vector. And we'll convert it into a vector field in the in the in, in um, uh, representation vector fields in the differential geometry package. Historically, it's pretty interesting that uh, people spent a lot of time building partial differential equation solvers specifically to calculate the large systems of overdetermined equations you get when you solve PDEs. So fortunately for us, we now have a fairly good PDE solver in, in Maple. I don't know, I don't know about other languages. And, and that was uh, and that was started by Greg Reed and others with a goal of, of integrating the symmetry equations or the defining equations for point symmetries, but it evolved and morphed pretty quickly into a general partial differential equation solver. That's what I've coded up in the different in my differential equations command in my differential geometry command called infinitesimal symmetries of of EDS, and that works pretty well. I think next time I'll give a I'll give a, a, a demonstration of how how one can use uh, the DG package to calculate recursion operators for um, soliton equations and so on. Of course. If you use the computer to compute symmetries, you're always going to be stuck with the question. So you want to solve your linearized equation of delta on rho equals zero, uh, or the defining equation, lead der le derivative of PR K of X delta equals zero. You can plug this into the computer and you'll be very happy in many situations. Uh, if it's the system's not too big, uh, that you'll get some kind of answer out. 
And then you'll have to say, well, do you want to use this in my, pa in my paper? <coughs> How do I know I've got them all? All the symmetries. And so that's a sticking point with just sort of plug it, plug in, plugging into a computer program. How do you know it's calculated all the symmetries and how can you prove that in some rigorous way? And I would propose then that one of the things that's sort of lacking, uh, certainly within the differential geometry package, is kind of a tractor approach. These systems of uh, differential equations for the symmetries are large overdetermined systems of linear equations. In many cases, you, you can uh, rewrite that large system of differential equations as a set of equations for parallel transport for a connection, for linear connection on a big space. And then just by calculating the current, the kernel of the curvature of that connection, you can count, you can get a formula for the nut you can calculate how many symmetries there should be so this is this is essentially going to be an algebraic approach to getting the count of the number of symmetries for an equation and this is not done and frankly i really don't know i mean if i'm dealing with parabolic geometries i know i know about this kind of tractor connection for calculating symmetries, but I really don't know in general a good formalism or a good theory for calculating the tra tractor connection for, for a system of differential equations. What was that? Hello? Oh, maybe that was just me. Okay. The other thing uh, that I can do for Lie algebra is if you give me a Lie algebra, I can calculate its automorphism group, and I can actually calculate the discrete automorphism group of a Lie algebra. But I don't really have a good idea on how to calculate discrete symmetries of a system of differential equations. Okay. So let me just end. I thought I wanted to keep this this whole presentation as simple as I could. So. Let me end with a, this discussion of symmetries with a little curio I call this a curiosity that I hit upon a few years ago. Maybe maybe people have seen this before. Maybe they have not. So let me. Uh, and the problem I wanted to do is I wanted to build a, a Fafian system with SL two symmetry. So I wanted to build a two three five distribution or two three a rank two distribution on a five manifold with SL2 symmetries. And here's, here's how I did it. So first, this is just a little maple demonstration. First, yeah, I created a Sorry, five Ian. manifold. Yeah. Ian, I'm, I'm just seeing a, a big uh, dark rectangle on, on the screen here. Ah, what happened here? You can't see the maple worksheet? Nope. Hmm. I just dragged it over. Let me let me try. What should I try doing? It's, it's black it, big window. It's what? It's on the black wrong window. Big, uh, window. So it's all, okay, yeah. It's all you, you still have your notebook in the background. So maybe maybe you're um you need to share the share set needs to be changed. Let me just just. So we you see your notebook. Let me try. Sorry about this. Let me try one one thing. Let me come to here. Where's that? Where's that share? Can you try hitting the reshare? Uh, yes, you stop sharing. Maybe share the other. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop sharing. I'm trying to find. Stop sharing. That. Yeah. And then reshare or something like that. Let me. Stop I've sharing. Lost the, Should be at the bottom of your screen. I've lost the share thing here somewhere. I thumbnail video. Oh, here it is right here. Okay. Uh, oh, resume share. How's that? Let me hit, hit, hit that. No change. New share. Oh. Can you share like desktop yeah. maybe or something? Try that. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, there we go. go. Okay, yeah. very good. Thanks. 
So here's here's a little maple demonstration. And I just wanted to show. Uh, problem is that uh, problem I was interested in is I wanted to use some of the theory I developed for studying uh, um, properties of the. I wanted I wanted to create a, a zero curvature formulation for the Louisville equation, and for that I needed a uh, distribution with uh, two plane distribution in five dimensions with SL2 symmetry. So here's what I did. I kind of knew what I wanted. So here's what I did. I created a five manifold. On that five manifold, I introduced these three vector fields, partial U, uh, U partial U, U squared partial U. This is the standard um, action of SL2 on the line. And then I lifted this up to, to, to the one jet. And so here's a scaling. There's the one derivative part. Here's the inversion. Here's the, its prolongation. Mm -hmm. Now I have, let me just check that I've done this right. And one way to check it is to see if these three vector fields form a Lie algebra of SL2, and they do. And now what I wanted to do is um, uh, take the uh, linear representation of SL2. Uh, on a two-dimensional space with coordinates t1 and t2, and use that linear representation to uh, to extend these vector fields. So I lifted these vector fields up into a five-dimensional space in the following way. Uh, looking at the structure equations, I knew that uh, x I had to had to x I had to add to x uh, a vector field representing upper triangular matrix. Here's the Cartan subalgebra. So I had to add a trace tree um, a vector field representing a trace tree matrix to that, and then the lower uh, triangular matrix there. And just to check that I still have a Lie algebra, we have this. Okay, now I want to look for a Fafian system, uh, which is invariant under the action of these three vector fields. Okay. So I've got my contact system and two other vector fields, which I wrote in this simple form. Okay. And now I Lie differentiate each of these vector fields with uh, each of these forms with respect to each of these vector fields, generate a system of symmetry equations, pass it to PDE solve. Here's the solution, back substitute in, and here's my distribution right here. So this is a three one forms on a three-dimensional, on a five-dimensional space, which has SL2 symmetries. And then I said, well, let me ask, let me ask, ask if there's any more symmetry. So I calculate, I use my command infinitesimal symmetries of EDS to calculate the full symmetry algebra of this. It takes a minute to, to run and you get this big mess. But the first thing I did was count how many vector fields there were. And of course, I would be talking about this if the answer weren't 14. And so I started off asking for an EDS with three symmetries, SL2, and by some miracle, and this was a very natural construction, that's what I want to point out, by some very natural construction, I ended up with uh, a, a new system of, a new Fafian system, well, it's not new, but a Fafian system which had 14 symmetries. So I, I could have discovered G2 by myself a long time ago through this construction, and I don't understand why this happened. And I don't understand whether or not this can be used uh, to generate other exceptional Lie algebras. So this is just kind of a little curiosity there. <laughs>